So the goal for today is to review orbitals. Uh, let me try to explain to you why we need to review orbitals. Uh, hopefully this is mostly a review of stuff that you learned in Chemistry 201. Um, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page about how to use your understanding of orbitals to make predictions about organic chemistry. Try to remind ourselves of why we should worry about orbitals. Uh, and so I want to bring you back to a common situation that you might face where you've got two reactants and there's multiple different pathways and you're trying to decide which of those pathways is most likely. I take a t-butoxide anion and some sort of a ketone and there's choices here. You can attack the carbonyl or you can deprotonate. And there's two different sides you can deprotonate if it's not a symmetrical ketone, which is virtually always the case. And so how do you decide which of these pathways is more likely? If I ask you that question on the exam or on a problem set, how do you explain and justify which of those you think is the fastest? And what I'm telling you and what I have told you in the last lecture and I'm going to continue to tell you is there's three different ways that you can describe this. Three different factors that are all distance dependent. As, all, as these two reactants get closer and closer and closer, um, you need to explain these differences in pathways based on either sterics, orbital interactions, or charge. And that's it. There's no other things that you should use to explain what's going on in your reactions. And so if you can master these, then you're really going to have a handle on organic chemistry and being able to predict what's fast and what's slow. And what I reminded you in the last lecture is that orbital interactions are really a representation of arrow pushing. If we break down our reaction mechanisms, into individual elementary reaction step where each step has a single transition state, then we can equate arrow pushing with the interaction of filled orbitals with unfilled orbitals. And that's very powerful. So this idea that we can, uh, uh, let's see if this automatic slide thing, wow. Okay, I'll just kind of come over here and manually move <laughs> these uh, slides. Okay, so, um, so we need to really embrace this idea that orbitals are important and the interaction of orbitals are, are, are important. Okay, so here's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to get you back on track or maybe just remind you of the three types of orbitals that you need to have mastered uh, and what do you need to know about those when you want to think about the interactions of filled orbitals with unfilled orbitals. So we're going to start off by talking about atomic orbitals. Uh, then we're going to talk about what happens when you hybridize those atomic orbitals, S and P, and how you can make powerful predictions based on that. And then finally, we're going to talk about molecular orbitals. Now that really serves as the underpinnings for understanding organic chemistry, what's reactive, what's not reactive, things like that. So let's start off over here with atomic orbitals. It's not a lot to say. Um, the important thing I want, want to point out is that we have to think about orbital phasing. And later on in this course, we're going to talk about uh, pericyclic reactions, an entire group of reactions where phasing is critical. So let me just remind you that for the second row atoms, we have 1s orbitals, very close to the nucleus and very low in energy. And when we step up to, uh, to 2s and 2p orbitals, there's now a node there so that there's two different phases here. So for 2p orbitals, they're kind of obvious. You have um, two possibilities for orbital phasing. They're arbitrary. If you've done some sort of quantum mechanics, you know that those, those are represented by plus and minus signs in the equations. When I draw the 2s orbitals from now on, I'm not going to draw that little interphased core. Uh, it's there, Don't, but there's just no way for me to draw that every time without making my drawings complex. Basically, 1s orbitals are so low in energy, uh, we're not going to worry about those. They're not important for bonding. And I'll remind you of that in just a little bit. So the phasing is important. And we're going to have to keep in, in mind this phasing idea. And what is the phasing about? You can think of it as a way for two electrons to avoid each other, if you'd like to think of it that way. Right? There's two electrons in every orbital. How do they sit in the same orbital simultaneously without repelling? It's not like one electron spends time here and the other spends time there. Each electron spends equal amounts of time in both uh, of the phased regions of, 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 that, uh, of that atomic orbital. OK, so atomic orbitals, S and P. So once again, we're going to think about, because we mostly think about carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, this is organic chemistry, second row atoms, we're mostly going to be thinking about the 2s and the 2p orbitals. Down, way down at the bottom here, there's, there's 1s orbitals that aren't involved in bonding. Forget about those. They're not important for us or anything that we do. So I just want to remind you um, of two basic facts. Fact number one is that p orbitals are higher in energy than s orbitals. So this is a molecular orbital energy diagram I've drawn right here. And the energies are in electron volts. There's nothing you can do with those that, that allows you to use those. It's not like kcals per mole. Don't treat this like some sort of a reaction coordinate diagram where 1.4 kcals means something. 
So just kind of forget about the units here. The important thing is that there's energy and p orbitals are higher in energy. If you're a pair of electrons in a p orbital, you are more reactive than a pair of electrons in an s orbital. It's that simple. A lot more reactive. Not a little, a lot. So that's fact number one to remember. Second fact that you need to remember is that electronegativity decreases the orbital energy. That kind of ought to make sense. What's the difference between boron and carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and fluorine as we march across this second row? You're adding one more proton to each of those elements. Carbon has one more proton than boron. Nitrogen has one more proton than carbon. Oxygen has one more pro it, it goes on through the series. It's monotonic. If you were an electron, wouldn't you want to spend your time next to a nucleus that has more protons? That makes sense. So look what happens if I take a carbon atom and I replace it with nitrogen. All of the orbitals drop in energy. Electrons like to be closer to atoms that have more protons in the nucleus. That's kind of obvious. And so if I go from nitrogen to oxygen, it drops even further. Okay, let's take a test. Somebody predict for me, where do you think the p orbital for a fluorine atom will be? Yeah, lower, excellent. Okay, so you've mastered this idea of electronegativity. And s orbitals on, for fluorine are going to be way down here. If you can get this idea that electronegativity drops the energy of the orbitals, you are halfway there. Because we're going to apply this same thinking to molecular orbitals. And you're going to use this to explain reactivity in organic chemistry. Okay, so now let's talk about hybridizing and mixing together orbitals. So let's imagine a single carbon atom. I'm not mixing two different atoms. I'm not making bonds. I'm just imagining taking the s and p orbitals on a single atom, like carbon, and then mixing them together so it's not pure p and not pure s. So if I take one of these 2s orbitals, like this one aligned with the x-axis, and I mix it with a 2s orbital, there's two arbitrary phasings for this, one with the dark on the left side, one with the dark on the right side, and vice versa. And so when I mix those two together, there's two possible combinations. One where the, the I guess I should have made this a dark green. So one where the greens add up on the left side, and one where the greens add up on the right side. And so if I take two orbitals and mix them together, I will always get two orbitals out because there's two arbitrary phasing combinations. So that's just a rule of mixing. You mix two orbitals, you get two orbitals, and that is because there's always two arbitrary phasing combinations. Well, what's important here is, uh, in a sense, the shape of the orbital is important. But the thing I really want to get across is the energy of the orbitals. If I take a 2s orbital and mix it with a 2p orbital, I'll get two orbitals that are midway in energy. They are going to be higher in energy than an s orbital, but importantly, they're going to be lower in energy than a regular 2p orbital. And now, let's imagine what happens if I take two of these p orbitals and mix it with an s orbital. So when I mix three orbitals together, all on carbon, for example, I'm going to get three new orbitals out. And since I'm mixing in more p orbitals here, they should be even higher in energy than my sp. So this is the classical view of sp2 hybridized carbon atoms. So if I take a carbon atom that's sp2 hybridized, I can now use those hybridized orbitals to think about how it forms bonds with hydrogen atoms, with carbon atoms. And if I'm a pair of electrons in one of these orbitals, doesn't matter whether it's a bond or a lone pair, I should be more reactive and more nucleophilic than a pair of electrons in an sp orbital. I should be more nucleophilic than a pair of electrons in an sp orbital. The more p character that we mix in, the more reactive those electrons will be. So maybe it doesn't matter so much for bonds, because you're not used to using these bonds as nucleophiles. But for lone pairs that you are used to using for nucleophiles, this same thinking will apply. So when I mix in all three of these p orbitals, and now it's 75% p character in these hybrid orbitals, look how much higher in energy these are. So sp3 hybridized uh, electrons in sp3 hybridized orbitals are going to be more reactive than those in sp or sp2 hybridized orbitals. OK, how much? This is what's not obvious, because it doesn't look like a big distance. Look at that small distance there. Right? That's not a big distance. How much of a difference could that make? Let's just remind ourselves of what kind of um, difference that. Oh, well, let me just stop and make things simple. Here's what you need to remember. Not all of those diagrams and the fancy stuff. I just want you to remember that the more p character you mix in, the more energetic those pairs of electrons will be.
If you can just pay attention to hybridization every time you look at an atom, you're empowered to know which pairs of electrons are nucleophilic and which pairs of electrons are not. And that's what you want to know. That's what you want to keep track of when you look at organic molecules. Okay, so how much more reactive? This will give you a sense. We're going to look at basicity because I can easily get those numbers, but in other words, attacking protons. But if I look at, at lone pairs on these three nitrogen atoms, lone pairs on nitrogen atoms, use those as bases to deprotonate things, as nucleophiles to attack things. And I look at the hybridization of an amine versus an imine or pyridine, doesn't matter as long as it's sp2 hybridized, or a nitrile. There's an increase in percent p character. You go from 50 percent p character to about two-thirds p character to 75 percent p character. And that small increase in p character translates into these differences in pKa. But it's deceiving to look at logarithmic numbers. We need to translate this back into base 10 numbers so that we can really get a sense for how much rea reactivity we're getting. When I look at, at, at this sp2 hybridized nitrogen, an sp hybridized nitrogen is this much less reactive. It's that much less basic. That's what that percent P character means. When you drop from 67 percent P character to 50 percent, you lose this much reactivity. That's a huge difference. When you go from SP2 to SP3, that 8 percent increase in P character translates to 100,000 times more reactive. Right, if I put a dollar bill in front of you and then $100,000 in front of you, you wouldn't spend half of an instant trying to decide which pile of money you wanted. Totally obvious, and I expect you to have that kind of instinct when you look at a molecule like this, right? Th that kind of information is staring you in the face about which of these lone pairs is more reactive. And it should be totally obvious to you, oh, that's SP, that's lousy. We should expect that to be relatively unreactive. Then I look at this SP2 hybridized atom right there, and that should be 100,000 times less basic and less nucleophilic than this nitrogen lone pair there, it's the sp3 hybridized nitrogen that's really reactive. All nitrogen lone pairs are not the same. You have to pay attention to hybridization. That information was there for you to use from the very first week that you took sophomore organic chemistry. They explained this stuff, but they didn't make a big deal about it, and they should have made a huge deal about that at the time. So in this previous slide, I showed you that electronegativity affects reactivity. It matters whether things are oxygen or nitrogen or, or carbon because those different atoms have different electronegativities. But it's not sufficient for you to just say that's a nitrogen lone pair or that's an oxygen lone pair. Amines ought to be more basic than ethers. Nitrogen lone pairs ought to be more reactive than oxygen lone pairs. But you have to look at the hybridization. Right? It matters, the hybridization. When you take an sp hybridized lone pair, yeah, that's a lone pair on nitrogen. But the hybridization kills the reactivity. That lone pair is less basic and reactive than the lone pair on a ketone or the lone pair on an alcohol or an ether. So you can't just look at the letter N or O or C. You have to also look at the hybridization. It's just as important. It's just as important. And it's as, it's as important as looking at the actual letter symbol in the periodic table. OK, so this is very powerful stuff and will allow you to make very powerful predictions about reactive intermediates, amino acids, nucleosides, whatever you want to look at. But there's one thing that we have to keep in mind, and that is you have to consider resonance before you use this hybridization stuff. Because resonance affects hybridization. So for example, if I look at this ester, here's one possible resonance structure for an ester where I have this oxygen on the carbonyl that's sp2 hybridized, and then this carboxyl oxygen down here, sp3 hybridized, but that's just one of two possible resonance structures. Right? If I look at this, I would conclude that the carboxyl oxygen on the bottom should be more reactive because that's sp3 hybridized in that drawing. But when I look at the other resonance structure, I know that those lone pairs are donating into this carbonyl group. I know that because esters are planar. There's double bond character there that hinders rotation about an ester carboxyl bond. Right? There is double bond character there. And that means that this resonance structure is important. In fact, when you look at, at, at the hybridization of these, this oxygen is more like sp2. And this oxygen up here, the carbonyl oxygen, is more like sp3. And that's why you, well, you could look at the charges to guess, 
But that's why oxy carbonyl oxygens on esters are always more nucleophilic than this carboxyl oxygen on the bottom. So you never expect that, um, that oxygen on the bottom um, to be more reactive. I'm going to get you to put some more <laughs> batteries in my laser pointer before I... Gene, the TA, is useful for a lot more than that. But, I <laughs> but for right now, I'm trying to keep the ball rolling here. OK, so, so super important hybridization, but always apply resonance before you draw conclusions about hybridization of atoms and reactivity. Wow. I got to, something is not working here, so I'm going to have to. <laughs> Okay, we're having a meltdown here on the. Uh, <clears throat> something was uh, going crazy. Here we go. Okay, so let's just summarize. Whenever you've got reaction possibilities, I want you to explain those possibilities. If I ask you to explain, or even if I don't ask you, I want you to rationalize the differences in reactivity based on three different effects that are distance dependent. As two things get closer and closer together, they can adopt different trajectories, different reactions. So I want you to think about sterics. I want you to think about orbital interactions, which really is the equivalent of arrow pushing. And then I want you to think about charge. And so the challenge then is which one is most important? Which is most important? So generally, you have a, a sense for when sterics is important. Thanks, Gene. So you, we should already have a sense for when sterics is important. So last quarter, you learned all about conformations. You learned about gauche butane interactions and 1,3 syndiaxial interactions. And sometime in sophomore organic chemistry, you learned about SN2 reactions at tertiary centers and how that's challenging in most cases, um, but not all. So I think you already have a sense for when sterics is important. It's mainly non-bonding interactions where you see that coming into play. That's what sterics is all about. And so what about charge? When does Coulomb's law come in? I mean, you can't actually do the calculations on Coulomb's law every time you see two molecules coming close to each other. That's dominant in things like fluoride doing, under forming hydrogen bonds. Fluoride is a very focused minus charge. When you have, whenever you have two ions getting together, sodium and chloride, that's when charge becomes important. Um, metal cations and alkoxides or ethers. And then it, there's a few reactions, and this is one of the things I talked about on the first day, like the reaction of tosylates, where there turns out to be a lot of, uh, of charge on that carbon atom of a tosylate. That's why tosylates react quickly. But when I look at the reactions where these MO interactions are important, it's things like enolates reacting with aldehydes, enamines reacting with, with oxocarbenium ions, um, allyl silanes reacting with things, conjugate addition reactions. In fact, the place where these MO interactions are, are most important is where charge is not important. Reactions at carbon. Reactions that form carbon-carbon bonds. And if you are an organic chemist, that's what you care about most. It's not that charge is always most important in chemical reactions or that sterics is all, always most important. Um, what's important here is that you're mainly interested in forming carbon-carbon bonds. That's what organic chemistry is about. And so organic chemistry is dominated by this, orbital overlap, by MO interactions. <clears throat> so we need to really embrace this idea of thinking about the interaction of filled orbitals with unfilled orbitals. And that's what arrow pushing, when you're really using it powerfully, represents. Uh, it represents the interaction of filled orbitals with unfilled orbitals. Um, Okay, so we'll try to get a sense for the implications of the, of the structure of that equation. I'm not a big math person, but I have a sense for how to use that. Let's go ahead and start off um, talking a little bit about, whoops, about the numerator here, and that is orbital overlap. Right? If I look at this, if there's one term that's on the bottom in the denominator, and there's a term that's on the top called orbital overlap. The more ob orbital overlap I have, the more effective I ought to be, the, the more stabilizing that ought to be. This is a, a negative energy term here. So orbital overlap is clearly good. So what are the implications of orbital overlap? Let's go ahead and start over here. 
I just want to take two carbon atoms with p orbitals and, and just imagine what happens as they get closer and closer together where those p orbitals can overlap really effectively or get farther away and they don't ever overlap so effectively. And all I have to do is look at an alkyne versus an alkene. The bond distance in an, al an alkyne is substantially shorter than the bond distance in an alkene. The p orbitals are closer together in an alkyne than they are in an alkene. And that means these p orbitals overlap more effectively in an alkyne. When they overlap more effectively, they make a more stable pi bond. Look at this, I've drawn it lower in energy. Better overlap makes a more stable pi bond. That's kind of rational. In contrast, the pi star orbital for an alkyne ought to be higher in energy. If I phase this in the opposite way, there's, there's more bad overlap, more destructive overlap if I flip the phasing on one of these two uh, p orbitals, on one of the carbon atoms. So when I compare an alkene versus an alkyne, the alkene pi bond is less stable and those pi electrons should be more reactive. And that's what we care about. Not the stability that, uh, of this single orbital. We care about the reactivity of these pi electrons. And conversely, when I, when I look, if I flip the phasing here and have a bad interaction, the pi star orbital ought to be lower in energy. That shouldn't be a very good, pl good place to put electrons. So there's this effect. When you get better and better overlap, your bonding orbital gets higher in energy and less stable. Your antibonding orbital is easier to donate into. So let's make a prediction off of this. We've got a very simple picture that's based on just looking at p orbitals and we can already predict the outcomes of chemical reactions. If I take this very simple substrate and you'd argue that, that the pentyl groups on each side are the same, really the only difference here is, is, is can be reduced down to, well there's a steric difference here I would say. If I were to make some argument I'd argue that this looks sterically more hindered than this. You can approach an alkyne from any possible orientation. There's less groups attached to these carbon atoms. These have hydrogens that I didn't draw. Um, but if you take an electrophilic reagent like MCPBA and do an epoxidation reaction, which of these ends up reacting faster? Right? You get an 86% yield of the epoxide. They didn't characterize the rest of the, it might have been 99% yield. This is their isolated yield. But more than half of the, of the reactant reacts here on the double bond of the alkene. You can't argue that that's sterics. You can't argue that there's more possible trajectories to attack the alkene. Uh, the, the higher reactivity of this alkene has to reduce down to the fact that alkenes are intrinsically more reactive than alkynes. So this is kind of a dramatic example. Even though it, it's got more groups on these carbon atoms, there's extra hydrogens here that aren't here. Um, even though the, there's only two possible trajectories for an alkene top and bottom face. So it's kind of dramatic um, in, in that case that you can see that alkenes are more reactive. Okay, so orbital overlap. So just getting things closer allows orbital overlap to be more effective for better or worse. Better for bonding, worse for antibonding. Okay, so, so just the distance between two things affects overlap, but what about the symmetry? So when you take two orbitals and you, uh, and you get them to interact uh, with like phasing. So for example, I take two s orbitals and I push them closer together, like two hydrogen atoms, I'll get a sigma bond out of that. There's a phasing combination that will be productive and produce a bonding orbital. And there's an anti-phasing combination that will produce an anti-bonding orbital. I'm going to get good interactions out of that. With a p orbital, if I take two p orbitals and I align them kind of parallel to each other, I'm going to get like, there will be one combination that has like phasing on top and bottom. That's going to lead to a pi bonding orbital. There's going to be a, a reversed phasing combination where the dark green is up here and that's going to lead to destructive interactions and that's going to lead to an antibonding orbital. That's how you build bonds. You take p orbitals and you mix them together in, in like versus bad orientations. And you can take mixtures of these. You can take an sp hybridized orbital and make it interact end on with an s type orbital like a hydrogen atom and form carbon hydrogen bonds. This is the way you learned about building bonds uh, at some point back in sophomore organic chemistry. So if you align them correctly, you'll get two new orbitals bonding and antibonding out of that. But what happens if you get them to interact incorrectly with the wrong symmetry? So what happens if I take a p orbital like this and make it react side on with an s orbital of hydrogen? You're not going to come up with a productive bond out of that. The problem is for every bit uh, of productive energy you get out of the like phasing, you'll get unproductive um, 
ne I don't want to say negative energy, but you'll, you'll get, end up with the destructive interactions with the wrong phasing combination. And they'll be equal. The, the prediction is that if you come exactly side on like this, you'd end up with no net bonding out of that. So you have to get things to interact with the right orientation in order to match the symmetry of the orbitals. Same with two p orbitals. I have to make them align in this, this parallel manner so that I can get at least one of those phasing combinations to be productive. If I come in ed edge on like this, again, I'll end up with no net bonding and no net anti-bonding coming out of that. So it matters. Now how does this relate to anything that you care about? Here's an, a simple example. This is called Brett's rule. It's, it's widely recognized when you have bicyclic systems like norbornal systems or uh, 222 uh, bicyclic systems. Brett's rule is simple. It says you can't have bridgehead olefins uh, at, at, in a polycyclic alkene. Here's the bridgehead right here. And you can't have a double bond there. And the reason why this, this simple rule works is because if you look at the orientations of the p orbitals that are attached to this carbon atom and that carbon atom, one of them has to be going in and out of the plane of this screen here, whereas the other one can go up and down. This is exactly this one of these bad phasing combinations that we talked about. These are interacting with the wrong symmetry. They're not interacting in this parallel mode where you get productive bonding. And in fact, if you were to synthesize somehow this anti brett rule compound right here, it would react exactly like two radicals right next to each other. It would react like a diradical. There'd be a pair of electrons in these frustrated p orbitals, one here, one here, that simply could not get their act together and form a bond. So phasing matters. And we're going to see a lot more of this phasing issue come up, as I said before, when we talk about paracyclic reactions, um, which will come up in a couple of weeks, or a week, something like that. OK, so phasing is important. So orbital overlap matters. So whenever you get two molecules that are getting closer and closer to each other, we have to think about sterics. We have to think about charge. And we have to think about <clears throat> this stuff. This arrow pushing business that's affected by orbital overlap, we have to get two molecules to interact with the right orientation to get effective orbital overlap. But let's take a look at the denominator to these terms here. And it's this, what it's saying is that if you want to get productive bonding, you have to get the orbitals to interact with the right symmetry, but you also have to pay attention to the energies of the orbitals. You have to pay attention to the energy of the empty orbital that you're putting electrons into, and you have to pay attention to the energy of the filled orbital that's donating the electrons. In other words, we have to pay attention to which electrons are most reactive and which places are best to put them. And I think that ought to make sense. Now here's, here's the thing about this equation that I'm, um, I hate to talk about it because it's very confusing, um, but there's a simplification that will come out of this. What this summation symbol says is that when two reactants come close together, Every single filled orbital in one reactant interacts with every single filled or unfilled orbital in the other reactant, and vice versa. So what does that mean? What that means is, let's take a look at the most reactive pair of electrons in this molecule, which will, will look kind of like this pi bond. So as this, gets, if this enamine gets closer and closer to this alkyl iodide, there will be a very favorable interaction between this this pair of electrons in this filled orbital and some antibonding orbital that looks like sigma star. But at the same time, as these reactants get closer and closer together, those electrons will also attack the CH bonds, the CC bonds, they'll attack the iodine. Those electrons in this orbital will be donating in, into every single possible empty orbital here. And it's not just these pi electrons. There's a lone pair type electrons that will be in interacting at the same time. They'll be interacting with antibonding orbitals for CHs for CCs. So the electrons in these lower energy orbitals will also simultaneously be donating into these empty orbitals. Every single filled orbital here will be donating into that carbon iodine antibond. They'll be donating into every one of these unfilled orbitals. And vice versa, there's lone pairs on this iodine here that are at the same time that these are getting closer together also donating back into the antibonding orbitals of this molecule. Every single filled orbital in one reactant interacts with every single unfilled orbital in the other reactant and vice versa. Okay, so why is organic chemistry so easy? If it's that complex, how could it be so easy for us to figure out what's going on? Uh, the advantage has to do with the fact that this is in the denominator. 
if you look at the most reactive nucleophilic electrons in this molecule here, the enamine, uh, I'm, I've schemed out the energy so it looks like this. Really what you care about according to this equation is the smallest gap. As this energy difference gets smaller, the overall term gets bigger. You form more productive bonds when you have super high energy nucleophilic electrons dumping electrons into very low energy empty orbitals. So as this gets smaller, this term gets bigger. And pretty much for every single organic reaction that you have ever looked at, there was always one orbital interaction, one single, it's always the highest energy filled orbital, that donates into some orbital that's low in energy. In other words, we don't have to pay attention to this. And if you'd like, you can work out the math yourself and convince yourself that as you drop this orbital energy lower and lower and look at the, the filled orbitals that are lower in energy, that this term becomes so big, as this gets bigger, this overall bonding contribution becomes so small that you can forget it. The only interactions that we will ever really care about when two molecules come together will be a single nucleophilic HOMO filled orbital donating electrons into a single unfilled orbital. And it's up to you to identify that most reactive pair of electrons in the nucleophile and the most receptive empty orbital in the electrophile. That's all you have to do. And you can ignore all these other orbital interactions. So that's why it's powerful that this is in the denominator. Okay, so it's really fortunate for us because when you look at the filled orbitals for a typical molecule, this the HOMO, uh, the, the highest energy filled orbital, it typically looks like either a lone pair, a pi bond, or a sigma bond. Those filled orbitals typically look like the kinds of things we draw in a Lewis structure. That's really convenient. In other words, you just keep drawing Lewis structures and pushing arrows and you're going to come out with the right result. And when you look at the antibonding orbitals, the lowest, the most receptive orbital, the one that's lowest in energy, that usually looks like either an empty p orbital, a pi star orbital, or a sigma star orbital. Now unfortunately, we don't draw those when we draw Lewis structures. Sometimes we draw the empty p orbital for carbocations. But we usually don't draw the sigma star, right? I didn't draw a sigma star orbital sticking out the back end. You have to use your imagination for that. Everywhere there's a bond, there's an antibonding orbital sticking out the back end. Um, everywhere there's a pi orbital, uh, you can imagine a pi star. That's a little harder to imagine, but I think you guys are getting practice with that. Okay, so very powerful stuff. Just try to identify the most reactive pair of electrons, and you just have to decide, gee, is it a lone pair, or is it a pi bond, or is it a sigma bond, and et cetera. Okay. <clears throat> it seems kind of abstract for me to talk about all those other orbitals, so I, I want to take a, a simple example for you. I'm trying to pick the simplest organic molecule I can think of, which is HCN. I'm not going to ask you about hydrocyanic acid. I'm going to ask you about the tautomer, because that's a little bit different from what we're used to thinking about. If I take hydrocyanic acid and put the proton on the other side, I'll have this um, kind of an illid structure, or a Twitter, uh, an illid type structure. I don't think there's any mystery as to what would happen if I took this tautomer of hydrocyanic acid and reacted it with an electrophile. And I think most of you have some guess where this is going to attack the electrolyte, or which end of that, or which part of that. Right, it's going to be this carbon atom. Um, but it's not quite as obvious if I ask you, what happens if I take this and react it with a nucleophile? Now it becomes a little less obvious to us. If we had to take some vote, where does, it, where does a nucleophile want to attack this? And how would I be able to answer that question? I told you already that you need to use three different things to, to think about reactivity, sterics, um, charge, and, and MO interactions. So let's take a look at, at the molecular orbitals for this. Um, because I told you there's all these different molecular orbitals, but it will help you just one time for one molecule to see all of the molecular orbitals, to help you demystify. Gee, what are all these molecular orbitals that Van Vranken is talking about? So here's all the molecular orbitals for hydrocyanic acid. <clears throat> And it's obviously, and I, I couldn't fit them all into one place, so I had to put this discontinuation here. So let's start off at the very bottom. Let's look at the most stable pair of electrons. Uh, I think there's 14 electrons in this molecule. And the most stable pair of electrons exists in an orbital that looks like this. And I don't know if you can see it here, but there's just this green sphere sitting around that nitrogen atom. What does that green sphere look like to you in terms of orbitals? Looks like a 1s orbital. <laughs> 
Exactly. Those are the electrons we said wouldn't be doing anything. Those 1s orbitals aren't making any bonds. And look how low we're now. I couldn't even fit it on the same scale. They're so low in energy. That lowest energy pair of electrons, we don't have to worry about getting involved in anything. Let's take a look at the next highest energy orbital. What does that look like to you? And I, the colors are kind of hard to see, but there's a green sphere around this gray. <laughs> That's a 1s orbital for carbon, right? Carbon's, nitrogen's more electronegative, like I told you. Carbon's less electronegative. Those 1s orbitals aren't doing any bonding. They're just sitting right there as 1s orbitals. But now when we, we cruise way high up, I've got this discontinuation and go to around 3 to 2 electron volts. What's this orbital look like to you? You might have to take some guesses. You're not as experienced as I am at, lo as, at looking at these pictures. Anybody want to take a guess? It's not a pure 2s because it's not exactly centered on, perfectly centered on the nitrogen. It looks kind of like a sigma bond between the carbon and nitrogen. And that kind of makes sense. If I drew out hydrocyanic acid tautomer and I asked what would be the least likely pair of electrons for you to be, to be moving around, and I guess the problem is that we don't typically distinguish, you know, this sigma bond that joins the center, that does not look very reactive. Re reactive to me. It's the pi electrons that ought to be more reactive. Let's walk up a little higher. So here's another orbital that looks like the sigma bond, kind of for an NH. Kind of. Squint a little bit. Right? These are, as we get higher and higher up, it's starting to look more like the bonds that we draw in a typical Lewis structure. Okay, I move up just a little bit more. So again, I couldn't fit all these next to each other. Here's that sigma bond for the carbon nitrogen. Here's an orbital that looks kind of like the sigma bond for an NH. Now I move up a little higher. Here's two orbitals that are degenerate. What do those look like to you? Yeah, they look like the pi bonds for a carbon-nitrogen pi bond. And finally, we get to the magical high-energy HOMO here. This is the most reactive pair of electrons. And you might be thinking, gee, they're so close in energy. The, those small differences in energy amount to a huge difference in reactivity. That tiny little electron volt difference in energy hugely more reactive. And that pair of electrons, the HOMO, looks like what? I, I guess I've drawn this reverse. <laughs> Let me flip this around so it's drawn with the same orientation. I hope that that looks to you like a lone pair at the end of this, at the end of this carbon atom, right? That's kind of satisfying. The, the highest occupied molecular orbital in this molecule looks kind of like one of the thing, the features of my Lewis structure. If you continue to correctly draw Lewis structures, you'll have very powerful predictions for reactivity because the Lewis structures resemble pieces, the bonds and lone pairs in Lewis structures look like homos. And if I, so now let's talk about, so that, that tells us which end is most nucleophilic. Now let's come back to the question I asked. If I were to take an electrophile, or sorry, a nucleophile and add it to this, Make some nucleophile attack, methylithium, an amine. Where would the nucleophile attack this? What I need to do is I need to look at the LUMO. And what the LUMO very plainly tells me, right, there's a pair of them, is that they should attack pi star, right? If you looked at 10 of these diagrams for molecules, you'd get it, right? You'll, you'll get it forever, and you won't have to look at these anymore. But for now, my, um, what, I'm, what I would tell you to do is keep drawing regular Lewis structures and use regular Lewis structures and arrow pushing to continue to make predictions, and it's going to work. You don't have to look at these orbitals every time, right? There's no time for you to draw these out. Just draw Lewis structures. Um, and here's how, how you can make sense out of drawing Lewis structures and, and taking stock in the fact that these these bonds and lone pairs and electrons in here represent the canonical frontier orbitals. So there's really only six types of canonical frontier orbitals. Frontier meaning either HOMO or, or LUMO. They're, they're either going to look like a sigma bond, they're going to look like a pi bond, or they're going to look like a non-bonding lone pair. And the unfilled orbitals are going to look like one of three things. The unfilled orbitals are going to look like an empty p orbital, or a pi star orbital, or a sigma star orbital. And that's it. So if you can just draw Lewis structures and continue to use those for prediction, then you're really empowered. So let's come back and ask a simple question. Here's an amine. 
And if I were to take an imine and react it with an electrophile, which of these three parts of the molecules would, would I expect to be the most reactive? And it's all embedded right here in this sort of ordering of energies. My prediction ought to be that non-bonding lone pairs will always be more reactive than pi electrons, if all things are equal. These are all centered on nitrogen in some way. Sigma bonds ought to be the least reactive, so this ought to be the most pathetic. You knew that already. You knew that there's no reaction where this methyl is suddenly going to lift away from the nitrogen and attack something. Right? You knew that. But I'm just spelling it out in terms of energies of orbitals here. This is why that's true. This is why you knew that. The second most reactive pair of electrons ought to be the pi bond. And the most reactive electrons ought to be that lone pair. This is a very, if you just memorize this relative ordering right here, you're empowered to make all kinds of predictions about chemical reactivity. Now let's take a look at the unfilled orbitals. What's the most reactive? What's the easiest place to put electrons, the lowest in energy? Empty p orbitals. That's why carbocations are so reactive. It's not because of the positive charge. I promise you that. If you take boranes, they are just as reactive. They react at diffusion controlled rates with nucleophiles. And there is no positive charge on boron in boranes. It's because the empty p orbital is so low in energy. And then you look at the next easiest place to attack. That would be the pi bond. Right? That doesn't look very easy because none of these atoms is, is electronegative. But I think it's a lot easier to imagine attacking that pi bond than to do an SN2 reaction and dis displace a methyl anion. Right? It is not easy for you to take a nucleophile and pop off a methyl anion. That's not because methyl anions are poor leaving group or whatever junk you learned back in sophomore organic chemistry. It's because the sigma star orbital is so high in energy. That's why. So if you can just remember this relative energy ordering for the three types of filled canonical frontier orbitals and the three canonical unfilled types of, of, of orbitals, you can make super powerful predictions about chemical reactivity. OK, so let's walk through some of the implications of electronegativity. So there's six types of canonical frontier orbitals. <clears throat> so I already told you about the effects of electronegativity. As I march across the second row of the periodic table, uh, I add more and more protons to the nucleus. So when I, as I increase the electronegativity of an atom, let's start off with a methyl anion. If I replace that with a more electronegative nitrogen atom, that non-bonding lone pair-like orbital ought to drop in energy. A lone pair on nitrogen ought to be less reactive than a lone pair on carbon. Amide anions are less nucleophilic and less basic than alkyl anions. Alkoxide lone pairs are less nucleophilic and less basic than nitrogen lone pairs, or amide anion lone pairs. And finally, a fluoride anion is nowhere near as nucleophilic as a methyl anion. So you already knew this, but this is why. It has to do with replacing carbon with something more electronegative. That's the effect of electronegativity, replacing an atom with something that's more electronegative. OK, let's take a look at bonds. You're not used to looking at bonds as nucleophiles, maybe so much. So if I come back over here and I look at this series, what would it take to make a sigma bond nucleophilic? Most sigma bonds aren't very nucleophilic. You're not used to seeing carbon-carbon bonds, sigma bonds, act as nucleophiles. That's not very typical. Um, certainly not carbon-nitrogen bonds. It's the lone pairs on nitrogen that react, not the sigma bonds that join nitrogen. If you really wanted to make this nucleophilic, you need to take carbon away and replace that with something that's less electronegative. You need to replace something carbon with something that's more electropositive, which will push the energies of that sigma-like orbital up in energy. And if you go to an electropositive enough atom, march all the way over here to lithium, you can raise the energy of this sigma bonding orbital so high that that's now more reactive than most lone pairs. And you already knew that. This is just this electronegativity effect, but we're going in the opposite direction. Um, and that's not so typical. Usually we're thinking about the effects of electronegative heteroatoms, uh, not electropositive um, atoms. OK, finally, sigma star orbitals, antibonding orbitals. What about the empty orbitals? It's the same idea. Electronegative atoms will drop the energies of the empty orbitals. Um, this looks like a pretty bad reaction to take a nucleophile and pop out a methyl anion as a leaving group. And it has nothing to do with leaving group ability, right, or something that they teach in sophomore organic chemistry. It has to do with the fact that the antibonding orbital gets lower and lower in energy as I replace carbon with more and more electronegative atoms. This almost gets to look plausible, displacing a leaving group like fluoride. 
And that's because the antibonding orbital is so much lower in energy than that for a CC bond. Okay, so if you can just remember the effects of electronegativity and replacement, <clears throat> replacing atoms with more electronegative atoms, um, then you're really on the way to using uh, um, frontier orbitals to their most powerful extent. Okay, super important point here, which I, I need to resolve this confusion. There's a huge difference between replacement and adding substituents. So I want to draw out two scenarios for you. Let's take these two pi bonds. Which of these two pi bonds is more nucleophilic? CC or CO? CC, of course. You knew that. Right? You already knew that when you add Br2 to something, it doesn't add to carbonyl groups, it adds to alkenes. You already knew that at some point. That's because when you replace a carbon atom with oxygen, these orbitals drop in energy and the pi electrons uh, and this carbonyl pi bond are lower in energy. They're not very reactive. That's the effect of replacing carbon with something that's more uh, electronegative. But now, look at this scenario. This is completely different. Instead of replacing a carbon atom, what happens if I add a substituent that's an oxygen atom that has lone pairs? In other words, I didn't replace a carbon atom. I added an extra atom to this that has a lone pair that can donate by resonance into this. And so now, we expect a different effect for substitution as opposed to replacement. If I add another functional group onto this alkene, that lone pair can interact with this pi system. I have a pi bond, I have a, a filled pi bond orbital, I have a filled oxygen lone pair orbital, and when they interact, they'll make two new orbitals. And because there was a pair of electrons in both of these orbitals, I get two filled orbitals out. One of these orbitals is higher in energy. Enol ethers are more reactive than alkenes because of this. The important thing here is there is an interaction between this orbital and pi star. Don't worry about that. Just worry about the fact that the reason why enol ethers are more important is because there's also an interaction with that filled orbital that creates a new filled orbital that's higher in energy. Okay, so there's a difference between resonance and substitution, or sorry, there's a difference between adding substituents and resonance versus substituting for a more electronegative atom. The important feature here is I've added a lone pair that can donate by resonance into that alkene. So there's, so you'll have a tendency to confuse those and we'll practice with that throughout the quarter. Okay, so um, <clears throat> bond length. What happens when we take a bond and we make it longer? So as I go from a carbon, remember we already talked about this, when you take two p orbitals and you get them closer together, you get more effective overlap. If I take a fluorine atom and a carbon atom, they're both second row atoms. When those hybrid orbitals get closer together, you get a very stable bond out of that. Because the orbitals get so close together, there's a lot of overlap. But when you start to mix in three p orbitals, or three uh, for third row sp3 type orbitals, or bonding type orbitals, you can't get very close. There's not very effective, there's less effective overlap between the orbitals in carbon and chlorine, and as a result, you don't get as stable as a pi bond. But at the same time, the antibonding orbital is not quite as bad. The antiphasing combination is not quite as bad. And so it is easier to donate into this antibonding orbital for carbon chlorine than it is to donate into the antibonding orbital for carbon fluorine. There's this pinching effect that as we take these bonds and we make them longer and longer, the bonds become less and less stable. And at the same time, the antibonding orbitals become easier and easier to donate into. These bonds are weaker and they're also easier to break. That's the effect of longer bond lengths. So how does that influence you? You're not really going to care about the nucleophilicity of this carbon-iodine bond. You're going to care about the lone pairs on iodine. But you will care about the ability to do SN2 reactions on alkyl iodides. That's why alkyl iodides are so much more reactive than alkyl bromides, which are so much more reactive than alkyl chlorides, etc. It not, has nothing to do with leaving group ability or whatever stability of I minus. None of that is the explanation for why alkyl iodides are superior for alkylation events. And this same thinking applies as we go um, to the carbon group of the periodic table. So as we go from a carbon-carbon bond, carbons close together, effective overlap, very stable bond, that bond's not very nucleophilic. But if I go to silicon, now the overlap isn't as effective. The bond is not as, as strong. And those electrons are more reactive. And that tiny difference, I hope you learned about this last quarter, that tiny difference in reactivity, huge increase in nucleophilicity 
carbon silicon versus carbon carbon. Um, I skipped germanium, that's not common. Went straight to tin. Carbon tin bonds, you know, carbon silicon is longer, carbon tin is even longer. Anything silicon can do, tin can do better. It's more nucleophilic. It's better at stabilizing beta carbocations. It's more toxic. It stinks more. Everything is, is better for, for carbon tin bonds. So that's just longer bonds. Carbon metal bonds, palladium, rhodium, ruthenium, all the same. They're long bonds. They will be very nucleophilic. Okay. Um, this, this effect of longer bonds, when you look at the pinching effect on the orbitals, HOMO gets higher, LUMO gets lower, it's the same with resonance. This was a Nobel Prize. If you could have extrapolated this, you would have won the Nobel Prize. If you extrapolate this out to an infinitely long polyene, you pinch these two orbitals so close together that they're the same, and you end up with a molecular wire. And that was, I don't remember, 10 years ago, that was the Nobel Prize. Somebody took this idea and moved it a little further. So what's the effect of conjugating and re conjugation and resonance. You raise the energy of the HOMO and you lower the energy of the LUMO. And you learned about that when you did Huckel theory last quarter, when you got introduced to Huckel theory. What's the impact of this? That a diene ought to be more nucleophilic than an alkene. You knew that. But w maybe what's not so obvious is that, that it's easier to add nucleophiles to a diene than it is to an alkene because the LUMO is lower. And as I keep adding resonance interactions, I keep making it easier to add nucleophiles, and I keep increasing the nucleophilicity of, that tri or of the polyene molecule. So this is why alkene dienes react faster when they're conjugated than when they're non-conjugated. It's not carbocation stability. That was, right? You could draw the products and say one product is more stable, but it's, the stability of products does not determine uh, which reactions are faster or slower. That's not, um, that's not what makes, we'll, we'll talk about that idea later. And then at the same time that these react as nucleophiles faster, they also act as, as electrophiles faster. Conjugated polyenes react faster with nucleophiles. They get attacked faster than non-conjugated <coughs> polyenes. And all of this, right, we're just looking at a single orbital out of many orbitals. So it is true that, that conjugated dienes are more reactive even though conjugated dienes are more stable. The overall molecule becomes more stable, even though the most reactive pair of electrons in that molecule, that one orbital is higher in energy, even though all these other orbitals get lowered in energy. So you can have one pair of electrons, for example in this diene, become higher in energy, even though the overall molecule is more stable. Those are completely different effects. The energetics of a single pair of electrons versus the overall stability of the molecule, those aren't the same. So you have to treat those as different. Okay, so that's all we have to say about um, just the basics of molecular orbitals here. I've summarized it all in this one page, so it's in the handouts. When we come back on, um, on Friday, I'm going to talk a little bit about, the, in particular, about the shapes of molecular orbitals. This is going to turn out to be very important when we talk about paracyclic reactions um, and some regiochemistries in reactions. So I'll see you guys here at uh, noon, and we'll go over some arrow pushing. And so, uh, right, we're not, probably not going to draw a lot of orbitals. We're just going to do a lot of arrow pushing. That's what the orbitals represent.